All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is going to be Microeconomics, Chapter 13, and we are shifting from negative externalities to positive externalities and public goods. Um, so, this is one of my favorite chapters. I'm excited about this, uh, the reasons why we do need government. Um, so if you want to pause it after you've read the chapter and uh, look through the notes and you want to open up the notes, you'll find it in the file section in Canvas. All right, um, here we go. All right, section 13.1. Why is it inevitable that sometimes the private sector will underinvest in, in, in innovation? Okay. Uh, there are a couple reasons. First, um, we shouldn't just think that innovation and research uh, is, is always a good thing for the firm, right? Um, it can be good. Innovation and research and development can be good in that they can they can offer a, a usually a short term technological um, or manufacturing or etc. Um, innovation um, it can give you a competitive edge which will ergo give you a greater profitability uh, and so you'll have an edge over your competition. Um, but this is assuming that you're able to keep that technological edge, right? Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why that might not happen. Um, first of all, there is, as, as sad as it is, there is commercial uh, intellectual theft. It, it just, it exists in the world. Um, it exists between firms. It exists between states. It exists between um, rival philosophies on the international scale. So autocracy and sort of autocratic free market uh, in the vein of Russia and China um, versus democracy and democratic free market, which would be the EU and America. Um, even they participate in sort of taking innovations from each other um, because e even not as an individual state or an individual firm, they still see themselves as in some sense an individual in competition against another individual, okay? <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> there can be a lot of uh, just technological and innovation theft, uh, intellectual theft, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there are some really interesting examples out there. Uh, first of all, uh, Eli Whitney, who invented the cotton gin and invented lots and lots of improvements upon the cotton gin, which was basically made to take a cotton bowl uh, and tear the seeds out of the cotton bowl and separate the cotton fibers from the seeds and the plant material, right? Um, Eli Whitney was a black man uh, during a very difficult time in the South in the sort of cotton agricultural market uh, in America, um, and the courts basically decided that even though other farmers and producers had stolen his, his concepts and his invention, and even though he had patents, uh, it didn't matter because he was black. So um, pretty, pretty tough situation there, right? He did, he did really great things for the American agricultural system, uh, especially in states like Georgia, um, Missouri, these sorts of uh, cotton states. Um, so, tough, tough story. Uh, Gordon Gould invented the laser in the 1950s. Um, it took him, man, a decade to finally convince everyone that he was the actual inventor of the laser technology. Um, by that time, lasers were so um, ubiquitous and had changed so much from the original form that Man, Gordon Gould was basically SOL. Uh, he lost all his attorney's fees and everything, and so he did end up winning his case, but it was a Pyrrhic victory um, in that he sort of he lost out in the end, right? And then you have Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing created the modern computer uh, and created the ideas that we now have behind... Um, computer computational algorithms, um, our ideas of what AI should be, um, how computers work, uh, and instead of making him rich and famous, uh, he was basically outed for being a homosexual in 1960s England. Um, he was chemically castrated by the state, so they chemically destroyed his testicles, uh, and then he killed himself. 
Um, terrible story. So anyway, we'll get back to some more positive, uh, but these are some really interesting things about um, sort of innovation and theft and, uh, and the difficulties of not only proving, but also sort of, of monopolizing, I shouldn't even say that, uh, profiting upon uh, your own inventions or your uh, innovations or research or whatever it is, um, sometimes it can be very difficult. Uh, and as we touched on in the last chapter, um, one of the things that can improve that is better property rights, right? Um, and of maybe even a quicker judicial system where it doesn't take 15 years to prove that, uh, okay, um, I've, I've spent of millions of dollars on attorneys at this point and the technology has completely passed us by and so now what's the point you know uh, that sort of thing really hurts the american system and, and hurts systems across the world um, especially as fast as technology moves today in biotechnology and um, electronic engineering and computer engineering and all of these things if you can't determine who invented these things and he can't present a patent and protection over that thing, whatever it is, uh, then our system is of no use, right? And you're just going to see rampant intellectual theft and, and it, it pushes down the, the uh, incentive to innovate, okay? All right. Um, as we talked about last time, positive externality, negative externalities are just things that the, the firm or the, the two involved in sort of a purchase, uh, whenever spillover effects happen to a third party uh, and those are bad, that's a negative externality. This is the same concept except for positive. Um, whenever, whenever something happens, especially research and development or these sorts of things, um, or a, a vaccination, right, it has, it has a greater overall benefits than just for the individual or just for the two individuals in the transaction. Um, um, roads are good for everyone. Vaccinations are good for everyone. And, and it's good for more than just the single individual. So you see a positive externality. Okay. So we're going to shift from negative externalities to positive externalities um, and why we do need things like um, government research and development and public goods and things that can't be provided profitably or even conceivably really by, by the private market. Okay. All right. So, uh, positive externalities. I would have you look at figure 13.2, where we are discussing positive externalities and technology. Uh, this is another really simple graphical explanation of how this might work. Okay. Um, so it basically wants you to say, to, to see the S line. And this is where the interest rate is set. Um, it is at, in this hypothetical, it is at 8%. Uh, excuse me, your rate of return. So this is your rate of return um, based on the interest rates and and how much you will you will get back uh, from your your investment in some innovation. Okay, and we are at equilibrium zero. This is where the firm would produce the product that gives some benefit to society. Um, if the firm cannot take on any of those external positive externalities, okay? Um, now, society in general is on the de-social line, the, the social demand. This is where the actual benefits are for the entire society. They're on this, this second demand curve. All right. So the first demand curve where you have D private with an equilibrium of E zero, that is if the, if the firm itself who is producing some good cannot reap any of those difficult to garner third party external benefits. Okay. And they would decide to produce, uh, they would borrow $30 million in capital uh, and get a rate of return at 8%. Now, um, society itself, with the firm included in everything, would actually choose equilibrium one, where we are on the demand curve social. Does that make sense? Um, society actually wants 
these benefits and society benefits from them. And so society would actually like to provide $52 million worth of investment in research and development. Um, and so the point of all of this is this, this blue highlighted sentence where I try to put it all into my own words here. The point is patents and intellectual development rights and, and property rights and trademarks and all of these different government functions um, to try and ensure that the company can keep some of the benefits of their research and development. Um, they they want to use these tools to push this equilibrium zero demand curve private somewhere between E0 and E1. Now, Ideally, we would we would push this all the way out to E1, right? But that means that like our intellectual development and property rights are working at 100%. There's no way that anyone in society can possibly get any tiny benefit from this. It's all going to the firm. But that's nearly impossible, right? And so the point of this is to try to help the company and to push further development of funding and research um, by, by trying to protect some of those benefits that are leaking out into society. <clears throat> and the way that they do this with, say, a pharmaceutical innovation is they give that company a 21-year patent on that product. Um, and so, yes, some of the benefits are going to leak out into society, right? Um, this new company has just cured cancer. OMG, right? Um, it's incredible. It's a new, huge innovation. Um, and, the, and the government to try and help make sure that other companies are not stealing their, their platform and their innovation and their new drug or whatever gives them a 21-year patent. They're starting to cure cancer. But even at that point, even if the patent works 100% perfectly, um, there are still other benefits out there, right? Now, people who had this, this highly specific type of breast cancer are surviving. They are now living longer to work in society. And so society garners some extra benefit from this pharmaceutical that literally cannot be soaked up and sucked up and given back to that firm, right? And so, so. Again, that's the ideal is that we push it all the way out to equilibrium one. That is an impossibility in reality. And so we want to try to find some really nice fit between equilibrium zero and equilibrium one. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. And that is where government steps in. That is where patents step in. That's where intellectual property rights step in. That's where all of these things step in um, to try and try and make it as beneficial to the company as they can. Um, you'll never get 100% capture back. It's impossible. Um, but the the government can help the firm uh, to capture some of those benefits push their demand curve further out, produce more research and development in the future, uh, and protect their profits and assets to, to show an example to other firms what could happen if they were to innovate, okay? So there are a lot of moving pieces here in, in, in trying to incentivize companies, firms, individual purchasers, etc. all right? It's, it's, it's a lot more than just we want firms to, to compete. Um, Yes, we, we also want firms to research and development. We also want to protect them so that there's no theft in the, in the system. We also want to show other firms that if they do take the risk and innovate, that this could be possible for them too, and we will protect them too. And so we will start to set up this, uh, what do they call this, um, this sort of the moral circle, the virtuous circle that builds on itself, okay? And we'll talk about the other direction, the unvirtuous circle, and how society can completely collapse um, in a little while when we talk about public goods. All right. Uh, we should talk a little bit about human capital. Human capital is just uh, a way to... It's, it, it is... 
Research and development, okay? It is a way to invest in your society rather than investing in a particular piece of technology or a new medicine, etc., okay? Um, and individuals um, also offer a rate of return, a, a very high rate of return from what we're learning in social science and comparative science when we're talking about um, different societies, uh, where they are developmentally, and then how much they... Uh, they invest in things like uh, investing in their human in their human capital, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that here at the end too. Uh, but first, I guess I wanted to point out the the book's graphic for this was awful. So if you look at table thirteen point two, this is uh, the weekly earnings of wage and salary workers fourth quarter twenty sixteen. It is the, this book. Um, it is free, and it is a really, really well-written book. Um, there are some really boring graphics, and that's probably because it's free, right? Um, so you, you take what, what you get. Um, you got to give up something to get another. So there are always pressures. It's zero sum. Uh, so this, this graphic is really boring. I went and did some of my own research uh, for this chapter and found some more interesting stuff to show you guys. So um, it'll, it'll show you the exact same point the book's trying to make, but it actually has uh, what I think are better citations, um, better data, and much better presentation. So um, think about that. Like as boring as some of these are, <laughs> when, when uh, you turn in papers, think about um, how you could spruce up your graphics. Uh, um, we're even finding that, that scientific journal articles that are peer-reviewed and top, top, top quality, they're still a tendency for humans to love looking at pretty graphics, and so they're more likely to be published. Um, so keep that in mind, people. Humans love to latch on to something visual. So that's that's just like an extra for, for your own future work and for your own future papers and research or whatever. Uh, it, it's a really nice way. It's easy to visualize if you make a graphic rather than this, this really ugly table 13.2, right? Okay, so uh, the point here is that you get uh, benefits from investing in human capital. So you'll see the median, and again, I will repeat this over and over in this course, the median is always better than the average. Do not trust when you see mean or average in any sort of news report or government statistics uh, it's not a trustworthy statistic, and the better statistic almost always is the median, okay? So, uh, off my soapbox. Median unemployment rates and median earnings uh, versus educational attainment. And this is just in America, but this tends to hold true across societies, okay? And you find this really interesting effect where um, you get a beautiful curve all the way up. The more education you get, the more you're likely to earn and the less likely you are to be unemployed. And then once you get to like master's and law degree, um, but then you shift over to PhD, boop, <laughs> you get a tiny drop off back off, right? Um, because PhDs tend to not enter the private market as often. Uh, they tend to be um, attracted to universities uh, and public um, more public positions, I guess, uh, the, the public life. So government work, uh, universities, things of this sort. And so, um, the sort of, from what I've seen it expressed, uh, you get, you get a really high level of job security, um, and, but you give up some of that potential income. Okay. All right. Um, so this is this is a really interesting graphic. You can just see that um, for the individual, the the more educated you are, the more likely you are to get a better income, um, and the less likely you are to find yourself unemployed in the long run. Right, and this is just because your position is probably far more specified. Um, I'm not trying to be rude here, but it's 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 probably easier to replace, um, say, the 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 waste collector. Um, or the, the driver of the waste collection truck uh, than it is, you know, a nurse or um, a very specified, uh, you know, I don't know, 
know, an engineer or, or whatever it is, right? It just becomes more specific as, as you go up, um, which, which makes it harder to find a replacement, etc. Okay. Um, if you move down to this job market monitor graphic under the yellow title, Social Rates of Return on Education. Uh, this is a really nice graphic, and this is um, decades of economics research to try and simplify. This is a very simplified version, right? Um, so you have all nations grouped up into three categories. You have uh, A, which is the blue line, the low-income nations. Uh, uh, B, which is the red line, the middle-income nations. And then the green line is high-income nations. Uh, and then you see sort of what the social rate of return, this is not the individual rate of return, but what is the social rate of return on a dollar spent on a, a particular level of education, okay? And so if we look at primary school, if you pump a dollar into primary school education for a low or middle income country, you are talking about that dollar will bring you a return on investment from eight dollars to twenty six dollars on average on probably the median I'm not exactly sure how they measured all this I didn't read the whole paper um, right before this but uh, on average we're saying that for every dollar spent in a low or middle uh, income country you get a 18 to 26 times your investment back in the social benefits that it brings your nation. Now, high income countries for all of these in general are going to be, um, you're, you're going to get a lot less out of it, okay? And uh, the only exception is for very low incomes and very high levels of education, and I'll touch on that at the end. Uh, but for now, I just want you to see that um, in high education countries, for every dollar you spend on primary school, you get about $15 in return, about 18 for middle income, and about 26 for for lowest income. All right? You get your best return uh, for low income countries. And again, this is what we've been building on over time. We've talked about this. Um, it's a lot easier to get a return on your dollar or to get GDP growth or whatever you want to call it um, in low income undeveloped countries just because of the fact that they are undeveloped and there's a lot more there um, to build right? Um, when you're pushing against your possibilities frontier curve, it's a lot harder to get bang for your buck. Uh, just because you're already a developed country, you've already implemented most of the easy technologies or the easy answers, or most of, of the people in low income or in high income countries are already um, being educated at the elementary level. And so you're just adding a little bit to the top of the budget, um, which isn't bringing back as much of a return. All right. Uh, this, this should all start to click over time as, as we talk about these things from different angles. All right, so now we're moving from primary to secondary school. Uh, we're talking about the sort of high school uh, area. Um, you can see that everyone's return on their dollar is reduced a little bit, right? Because, again, e even from an individual state, now we're becoming more advanced. Um, and so as we advance, we're going to get less and less. Uh, this is the, your marginal diminishing return, um, another economic concept that we've been building on. Um, as, you, as you move uh, towards advancement, uh, in your education system, your dollar is going to start bringing you less as a nation, uh, but it's also going to bring you less on the comparative national scale um, if you're a richer country. Okay, so we see the same exact uh, concept, except now the the return on the dollar is being decreased a little bit. Uh, and so for a rich country, you get about $11 on return. For a middle-income country, you get about a $14 return. And for a, a low-income country, you get about a $19 return per dollar invested. All right? Now, we're going to move on to the tertiary level. This is like a college, some college. This is the sort of stuff, uh, maybe a little bit of trade school or whatever it is. All right, so it still works the same. We're getting another drop-off in our return on investment uh, because we're moving towards more advanced education within each individual state. 
We're also getting uh, the same separation in middle income and high income countries, but why not low income countries? Low income countries actually see a vast reduction in it, and it drops below middle and high income countries. It's a really interesting phenomenon. Uh, and this is generally because these people move, they emigrate, they leave their country of origin, they go to a rich country, and they help to provide for their own, uh, that that country of immigration's uh, economy, okay? And so the, the highest educated, the highest trained, the doctors, the nurses, the engineers, the, the you know, the, the really highly trained welders, things like this, they leave their really poor country of origin and they go to a developed country or at least a middle income country. Does that make sense? Um, it is a natural occurrence. In the worst states, if you can get your way out, you get out. Uh, and this is what we see across a lot of these really poorly developed states. And this is why I would caution people uh, to be scared of immigration. Uh, immigration is a phenomenal thing, especially for rich states, um, especially because our own population growth isn't even going to keep up. So our our uh, economy is going to inevitably shrink because we don't have enough babies to keep up with our own population. This is the problem you're seeing in Japan, and they, they won't allow anyone in. And so their economy is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, and people are just getting older and older. And and the kids are having to take care of them, uh, and which is uh, impoverishing the kids. It's it's a it's a whole disaster. You should check out Japan. Um, immigration can be a very good thing. So so uh, be careful about letting people scare you about immigrants. It's it's pretty silly because most immigrants are way more educated than you are. So um, okay, here we go. Uh, social goods of education. There are a lot of social benefits. This isn't just like, oh, I, I am smarter and I am paid more, so I spend more in the economy. No, that's not true. Um, you get better health outcomes because people are more informed about and more capable of informing themselves about uh, their own health, the human body, how it works, how to keep it clean, uh, what types of foods to eat, these sorts of things. Okay, uh, It reduces the crime rate in society. Uh, it ends up um, improving the environmental outcomes in society. And, and all of these things are even with other control variables controlled for, right? How much money is there in the society? How many environmental laws already exist? All of these things. Um, just education has its own alternative uh, and additional effect on top of all of those things that you would already think about, okay? Uh, democratic strength. Um, in the more highly educated states, we tend to see much stronger democracies, and we tend to see a lot less civil rest. Hint, hint. Um, this is a problem that we are starting to see in America. Our education system is pretty pathetic, honestly, compared to the rest of the, the developed world. We are falling behind drastically in science and math especially, um, and I think we all know the reason for that. Uh, and it's starting to cost us on the international scale, uh, and it's starting to cost our democracy. Um, and so, so there, there is going to be an explosion of research about this in the near future, which I'm very interesting, to re very interested to, to catch up on um, as it starts to hit in the next six months to two years. Uh, technological development <clears throat> also increases, of course, for education, uh, and unemployment rates for the whole society tend to be lower. So there are a lot of cool alternative benefits uh, from education and from all kinds of things. Um, and even from, uh, I know some of you are going to think this is touchy, but uh, there's some really cool research out there about abortion 
and the positive social impacts that abortion has on a society. Uh, if you go out there and check Stephen Levine's book, Freakonomics, from the University of Chicago, he offers a lot of evidence, and a whole lot has flooded in over the last 15 to 20 years or so uh, since he wrote his book, which just strengthened his theory um, that abortion actually, uh, when Roe v. Wade, Wade was decided in the Supreme Court in 1979, it caused this massive drop in crime in the 1990s. Crime was rising, rising, rising. We, we kept just throwing money at policing. And then suddenly, right around 1991, right around the time when all of these children, potential children who would have been born, um, would have been growing up to commit crimes and um, potentially be a drag on society, um, no longer existed. And we saw a an inexplicable drop around 1991 and 1992 in crime rates that no one could explain uh, because it didn't match any of the data. All of the data that suggested these are the things that drive crime were increasing and yet for some reason we saw this huge drop off right at this one year when all of those kids would have been turning 17 and 18 years old. Uh, and so there, there has been a whole lot more evidence since then. But all, a lot of these things that I just suggested are social goods for education, apparently are turning out to also be social goods for abortion. Um, so a little food for thought. All right. Uh, positive externality possibilities. There are a lot of different things that government or even private firms can provide that cause positive externalities. And I put together just a short list here so we could touch on some of them. Um, one, education we've already talked about. Uh, two, research and development, of course. Um, if we want to talk about, like a lot of people think that things like NASA are wasteful, right? Like, why are we spending all this money out here on NASA? And, um, but the the money that was spent on research and technology at NASA has led to an explosion of other technologies in aerospace engineering, in medical science, in medical diagnostics, in uh, road construction, in materials, in plastics, in uh, I mean, you name it. And there have been thousands and thousands of positive externalities um, that have drifted their way out of the NASA projects into the private markets and have benefited every single human in America. Okay, um, So these things are hard to measure, but they exist and... Uh, you know, so uh, some others, healthcare investment, social safety nets, uh, infrastructure is a really big one. Um, when we saw Eisenhower build the interstate system in the 1950s, uh, America got an enormous boom to its economy. Uh, we saw a much higher growth rate in the few years after that um, because of the ease of transportation. Um, so it was not only an excellent project uh, strategically and militarily uh, to be able to provide our um, biggest strategic and military equipment uh, with with just pristine roads and the ability to move from urban center to urban center uh, quickly if we needed to. Uh, but it also provided one of the biggest boons to our economy uh, that the world has ever seen, really. Um, so it, it was a truly remarkable project. And, and I'm really hoping the new Biden infrastructure project uh, kicks in because uh, America desperately, desperately needs um, an infrastructure revamp. Uh, we have bridges and dams falling down. We have plumbing crumbling, our electricity structure is, is pathetic, our, our internet infrastructure is non-existent and pathetic, um, at least in comparison to most of Europe and Asia. So, so we, have, we have severe detriments to our infrastructure systems uh, that we really, really need to spend money on if we're going to keep up, um, if we're going to keep up with the rest of the world, uh, especially with the developed world, um, and especially with China focusing their trillions of dollars on their one belt, one road policy uh, of building infrastructure across the planet so they can take over um, all of the ports and, and strategic areas on the entire other side of the globe. So uh, this is something that we really need to be paying attention to. Okay, uh, abortion, uh, vaccination is a really hot one right now. Um, there are massive 
external benefits um, that, that are provided to the society. It's not only about vaccinating you. It's about um, reducing the possibility of spread for everyone in your community, um, helping to protect the elderly, uh, helping to protect everyone, basically. I mean, if, if you can't shed virus, um, then, then it's helping all of your society. It's helping people to get back to work. It's helping people to get back onto planes. Uh, and now the European Union and America are talking about uh, vaccination passports. Like, basically, you can't leave your own state. You can't get on a plane. You can't get on a bus. You can't go into a federal building um, if you do not have one. So I'll be very interested to see um, what happens there and, and how the anti-vaxxers react. Um, the, I, I see people claiming all the time that like the government can't force you to take a vaccine. That's absurd, right? Um, you At birth, you take uh, mumps, measles, rubella, pertussis, smallpox. Uh, vaccines are one of the greatest inventions in the history of mankind, so... I don't, I don't even know where that stuff comes from. Uh, anyway, uh, efficiency in home construction would be another one. This is something that can reduce uh, energy and gas intake, things like this, uh, which can help to uh, reduce tension on our electricity grid, uh, etc. Uh, beautification projects can increase property values. Parks can help to increase property values, um, you know, so so even these things that some people think are wasteful, they have they have massive positive externalities that people don't often consider. OK, uh, Section 13.2. How does government encourage innovation? Uh, this one's fun because there are a lot of different ways. Just like we talked about in the last chapter, there are different ways like uh, cap and trade systems or. Or the government can just say, like, don't do this, um, <laughs> which is not the best plan. Uh, there are a lot of different ways of, of doing this as well. And um, again, as I talked about in the last chapter with just the idea of legislating and saying, like, you cannot, um, you cannot produce this much carbon uh, in, in an, a per annum, you know, or whatever. And, and they're just making these really simple, uh, very hard to, to enforce laws, that's sort of the same thing with patents and intellectual property rights. They were, they were sort of the, the first wave of democracy's attempt, and not even democracies, right, because autocracies sort of have some of these protections in place. Um, it's a little harder to enforce them, right, because it's an autocracy. There are not really um, independent court systems and et cetera, but... Um, you know, in theory, there are intellectual property rights, at least in autocracies. So, uh, it, that my point is, those were the, the sort of first wave of attempts to protect the social benefits for the private firm that did the innovation and the research and development, okay? Um, patents, trademarks, copyright laws, uh, all of it. Patents last 21 years. Um, again, it's, it's arbitrary. It's not very precise. Um, it also doesn't take into account different, different industries, right? Like, is 21 years appropriate in, say, biotech, where six months from now, your 21-year patent is going to be completely by the wayside because everyone, the, the technology has just passed you up. Um, what about like Moore's law in computing technology where they say that storage doubles every 18 months to two years? Um, that also means that technological innovation doubles every 18 months to two years generally, maybe a little slower than storage, maybe two years to every 30 months. Uh, but nonetheless, th the industries are moving so absurdly fast that 21 years uh, by that time, like it, your technology is going to be ancient and no one is going to care. Your patent is meaningless. Um, it's the same thing for, say, DNA manipulation or for uh, DNA uh, reading technology. Um, so, so these 21 years, it's arbitrary. It probably needs to be reformed and it probably needs to be changed by industry? I, I don't really know what the answer here is. I, I don't know that patents are the best way to do this. So let's talk about some more. 
Uh, government subsidies. Government can subsidize research and development. Uh, they offer money to universities. They offer money to private firms. Um, there are a lot of different ways that uh, government can get money to interesting research projects, right? So usually what happens is uh, the politicians will grant the National Science Foundation, the NSF, which is sort of um, arguably the world's greatest science foundation, um, and it's quite an honor to be a member. It's sort of like the Royal Science Found uh, the the Royal Science Society in in England um, when when they were discovering things like gravity, and you know, um, we're we're sort of on the same boat right now. We are top on earth. Um, so the politicians basically say, all right, well, here's 30 million. It's probably closer. Let's say here's $30 billion um, for research and development projects. Um, you get to decide where they go. Uh, that's usually the best way to do it, right? So the politicians aren't involved in determining <laughs> what science uh, is deserving of research grants. Sometimes it's obvious and politicians will just say, okay, obviously we need research on COVID-19 vaccines or whatever. And they'll say, here's a billion dollars. But even then they give it to professional scientists who say, okay, well, here's how we're going to specify that this money is being spent. Okay. Um, so you have grants, you have um, automatic research funding for universities, uh, you have tier one status for universities, which gives them automatic grant funding. Um, some of these sort of cross each other, right? Tax cuts and subsidies can also be considered government grants. Uh, cooperative research can be considered government grants. So just keep in mind, like, there's a lot of different ways for a government to get federal funding uh, to research and development. And this can either be at a university, it could be at a private firm, it could be a cross-university slash private firm partnership, uh, it can be a government laboratory slash private firm partnership, or a government laboratory and a university partnership. Um, a lot of times what they're doing now, which is really cool and innovative, and even private firms are starting to get into this into this uh, realm, is offering up uh, prize money. They'll say, if you can solve this tricky uh, technological problem that we're having, we're going to put up a $6 million grant. So whoever can prove to us that they've done this, will take this grant. And it's caused these really cool scientific competitions even where these teams of scientists are, are, are taking on these projects trying to earn grant money or just trying to like be be inventors and, and take the six million dollar prize and, and they're teaming up with each other and they're and they're having a good time of it and you know they, they talk about uh, all of these innovations that they're making and some of some of the innovations that don't even win uh, actually help other industries now. Um, Really cool stuff, really cool stuff. So this is just another way of, of incentivizing. You should always think in economics of incentives. How do we incentivize a particular behavior, a particular research and development, um, all of these things? How do we change incentives? And, and these are some really cool ways of doing it. All right. Uh, I also added some graphs here so you can see American research and development over time. Um, all of these, I think, come from the uh, the budget office uh, and the National Science Foundation. Uh, so the top one, which is from the National Science Foundation and is the uh, bar graph that's split between gray, red, and blue, uh, you can see the different research and development expenditures over time, uh, and they are all on the fiscal year 2020 billion dollar. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, they have calculated um, for inflation and made sure to adjust for that in, in these graphs. OK. Um, you can see that United States federal spending is pretty stagnant since the 19 late 1960s, um, basically since Nixon, since Nixon came into office, it's it's, it's been stagnant. It is. It is on average rising slightly, 
year per year, but you also see these vicissitudes, these waves, and generally these are um, different political offices, uh, Democrats versus Republicans, these sorts of things. Um, or it'll just be um, the economy itself. You know, is the economy doing well? We're going to pump more into R&D. Is it not? We're going we're gonna to shrink it a little bit. All right. Uh, but you can see that industry, that private industry R&D is booming over the years. It has probably deciled, uh, it is probably um, 10 times or more in, in the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, so private firm R&D is exploding. And a lot of this is because America is on the innovation frontier. Um, America is also learning that usually <clears throat> their, their investment dollar is better spent incentivizing private firms to do research than it is actually doing the research themselves. Okay, so they'll, they'll offer tax cuts, they'll offer partnerships, they'll offer grants, things of this sort. Um, but I think the mixture of both the free market philosophy of the American system um, and also the difficulty of pushing through new federal research programs um, has contributed to the fact that the federal expenditures haven't changed um, but also the ease of quote-unquote tax cuts for private firms has made it easier for the U.S. government to just simply incentivize firms to do their own research and development rather than exploding our research and development uh, uh, profile. Okay? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> You could also see research and development if you move to the next graph, the, the dotted line graph. You can see research and development as a percentage of the total budget, uh, but also split between um, military expenditures or defense, basically, uh, versus non-military, okay? And the non-military is the blue, and the military is the red, or, or excuse me, the total is the red. Um, so the gap between the two is, is the military expenditure. And you can see that... Um, Research and development as a percentage of the budget was high in the, the 1950s and 60s. Uh, this was during the boom of the NASA years, which is why we see this huge peak. Uh, this is Kennedy, basically. Like, this is, this is a complete anomaly from the pattern, as you can see. This was Kennedy deciding, I want to go to the moon. I want to win space, <laughs> and we're going to do it, you know, and we're just going to throw money at it. I don't care. Uh, so that's the space race. You can see that as the space race starts to wind down, so does American research and development dollars, uh, especially as a percentage of our, our budget itself, okay? Um, and it has it has evened out to about, oh, man, where are we, 3% of the budget, which... As a scientist, I hate, but maybe it's responsible. Uh, I'd, I'd probably need to re read more to tell you one way or another, but um, I'm all for, you know, uh, innovation. I, I love science, so. Uh, but yes, as you can see, the pattern itself has shrunk down, and as time goes, research and development is uh, decreasingly a part of the U.S. budget. Uh, and this is for a lot of reasons. This is One of them is the military expenditures are so high, uh, we spend about as much as the rest of the entire world combined. Uh, that is 192 nations' military budgets here. America's military budget here, okay? So they're about equivalent. Um, there's probably a lot more we could get out of this military budget. Uh, but again, that's more of a philosophical sort of right and left divide. Um, um, the guns versus butter argument, right? Um, there are other reasons for this too, though. Uh, one is that we've been just... We've been decimating our tax intake over the last 30 years. Uh, every time a new politician gets to office, they cut taxes. Nobody ever increases taxes. And so we're just working on smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller little pieces of money. Um, and I, I don't know where that ends because it's going to be a problem. 
eventually. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Um, let's see. Another reason is that things like uh, healthcare or Social Security are becoming larger portions of our budget as we keep shrinking our tax base. Um, we have guaranteed to the elderly and others, look, you've been paying into the system your whole life. Um, we want to make sure that you can eat and pay your rent at basic minimum. Uh, but as we just keep eating at our tax base, uh, those things are taking up larger and larger chunks. And it's not because those things are becoming more expensive. I mean, we 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 have it tracked to inflation. It it just it's the same every year. It's just becoming a bigger portion of our expenditures because we just keep saying we don't want your taxes. Uh, we don't. We don't need to research or develop anything. Um, so uh, again, I mean, we we just don't have money to spend because we've already promised the money and we keep cutting taxes. Okay, so uh, the very last one is defense versus non-defense. Um, and you can see that defense as a proportion of the U.S. budget uh, increased dramatically in the 60s. Uh, and a lot of this was due to the Cold War. Um, we were in an arms race. We were in a nuclear arms race. Uh, we were in a philosophical and moral arms race. Um, and so that's that's largely where this massive portion of the U.S. Uh, government expenditures came from, and it just has stuck since then. Um, it's sort of a... I, I don't know how you reduce it at this point, um, uh, but it, it, it's, again, it's going to... It's also taking up a larger and larger and larger piece of the pie, um, so we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions soon as a nation, I think. All right. Uh, lastly, public goods. A public good is a good where the positive externalities of the good are so vast and so complicated that it's impossible to privatize. I mean, you just couldn't do it. There are two uh, major determining characteristics of a public good. They are non-excludable. Uh, this just means that uh, if I'm using a good, uh, it's really costly or nearly impossible for me to exclude someone else. So think of a road, think of uh, parks, um, these sorts of things. Uh, it's also non-rival. Um, when I'm using it, someone else it can also use it. It's not a private thing. Right. And some examples include the fire departments, police, roads, bridges, dams, levees, um, a lot of these uh, coral reefs, even if you think of the things that, um, what are the things that are goods that protect our, man, excuse me, that protect our uh, coastlines. And um, these are things that people often forget until they remember about um, Hurricane Katrina or New Orleans, which is a really big part of our life down here in the south. Um, and so you think about the levees and the sandbags and the coral reef systems um, and the dam systems and uh, the, the water uh, runoff and, and release emergency systems. These are all also public goods that people don't usually consider. Uh, national security uh, and diplomacy is another one that a lot of people don't really think about and that wasn't even mentioned in the book, which frustrates me because it's such an important piece uh, of our national security strategy um, and it is absolutely a public good, uh, but it's, it's often sort of forgotten and, and thrown by the wayside. Um, especially in our last 20 years of, of foreign policy. So, uh, Free rider problem is a huge problem. The free rider problem is the fact that we have this good um, that everyone benefits from and someone's basically getting away with it for good uh, or for free. Um, and so these would include all kinds of different things. This is, this is generally the problem of non 
payment of taxation. And just like I was talking about the virtuous circle, as, uh, as I discussed in the very beginning of the chapter, and, and how government can incentivize firms and individual acting virtuously, and this virtuousness can build further virtuousness and further investment and further um, social benefits and good, it can also go the other way. And so if you look at states like Somalia or Eritrea, or Guatemala is a nice recent example in Central America, which is causing much of the flooding toward the U.S. populations, uh, the U.S. southern border. Uh, you get these free rider problems where um, people see the state as, uh, in a sense, illegitimate, or the state starts to lose its power to enforce its laws, and people stop paying taxes. And then the state... Um, suddenly isn't able to provide services. It can't maintain its roads or dams or bridges. It can't maintain its hospital systems. Um, it can't pay social welfare to the elderly. Um, and then that further degrades people's trust in the state and in institutions, and more people stop paying their taxes and I think you see the devastating consequences this can have where you end up with civil war um, or just murders and rapes all over the state, which is happening, which is what's happening in Guatemala. Um, and this is why people are, their, their kids and their family members are just being murdered left and right. Their kids are being kidnapped or snatched from school, they're being raped, um, and so people are afraid. They're just afraid, and they want to get out of there, um, and America is largely the reason why this is happening, because of the drug trade, um, and the drug cartels and gangs have taken over the streets of these states, and now the state is barely operational, and, and so you get this, um, man, what's the opposite? I said the virtuous circle, um, I mean, this is just, uh, I'm having a hard time with an, an antonym of virtuous, but uh, this is a, a terrible circle. It's You're basically going down the toilet drain. Um, and so this is something that you really have to be careful of, is protecting the legitimacy of your state and the state's ability to collect taxes. Um, ba -ba -ba. I guess uh, uh, the three last pieces of the chapter and the lecture, uh, there are some potential fixes. One is government enforcement, um, and this is why the IRS operates, and this is why the IRS has the ability to sort of um, track people down and force them to pay taxes or to put them in jail if they refuse to, um, to ensure that the state remains legitimate and that people aren't just deciding willy-nilly, well, I, I don't believe in taxes, so I'm not going to pay taxes. Um, that's, that's not acceptable in a modern state. Uh, there's also social pressure and humiliation. Uh, these are Deter uh, these are, at least according to behaviorists and evolutionary behaviorists, probably the best fixes uh, for maladapts, um, individuals who will not follow the rules, uh, you humiliate them. Uh, and we're finding out that um, evolutionary uh, behaviorism has produced this this need for humans, for the most part, right, the median human, uh, to fit in and to not be shunned by their community. And this is one of the region, reasons why religion is so strong, because they use this uh, tracking and shunning um, uh, technique. And it's very strong in humans and even in other animals we're finding, in birds, um, in lemurs, in uh, one of those little... Uh, the lemmings, the, the ones we think commit suicide, but that's uh, not not true. But but they're the same. Um, they they use a lot of humiliation and social enforcement. Um, so so some interesting stuff there too. If you if you want to read up on that stuff. Um, all right, that's going to be it for the day. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. This is one of my favorite chapters, uh, and I will get the next one out probably this afternoon. So stay happy and stay safe. Thanks, guys. Bye.